introduction. Good morning. Thanks for coming uh, so bright and early. Um, so I'd like to thank the, uh, the organizers and uh, uh, Jim Allen and everyone here at the uh, University of um, Michigan for the, uh, for the very interesting uh, meeting. And I, I think what's been really um, fascinating to me is, is that this compound is so rich that all of the kind of different experiences and um, impressions that we have um, of uh, magnetism and different expertise are really required to, to try to make some progress on it. Um, and it's in that spirit that I'm going to give my talk, actually. I'd like to um, start off by, um, by giving you kind of a, um, um, a uh, introduction which will not contain the image of a D band, which is, uh, which is hybridized with an F band. So this will be specifically eliminated from the introduction. Um, but instead, what I'd like to do is to give you examples of the kinds of um, kinds of problems that I've been that I've been working on, and that sort of inform the way that I'm thinking about the magnetism in smeron hexaboron. And maybe we'll just see if this one can be fixed. Uh, no? Is your mic on? Everything is on. It's on. It's on. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll fix the buzzing. All right. So yeah. So. So I'm going to uh, talk a bit about uh, what I would call singlet formation in uh, first in local moment systems, where it's really um, pretty straightforward in the sense uh, that, that there's a simplicity to it. Uh, then I'll try to sort of extend that into thinking about that kind of behavior in, uh, in a correlated metal. Uh, and with that behind us, we'll go and uh, begin to think about the neutron scattering from samarium hexaboride. Uh, of course, this is a, a well-studied uh, area, in fact. A little less perhaps with neutrons because it turns out that uh, this material is quite difficult to work with uh, for neutron scatterers. And yet there's some uh, really beautiful work that's been taking place over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, and now we have some new results that really come out of uh, using a new type of instrumentation to make progress uh, on this problem. And I'll try to um, connect uh, this, this uh, spin exciton to some, other, uh, some of the other experimental uh, features and some of the theoretical ideas that we've heard uh, about during the meeting, and there will be some conclusions and outlook. Uh, first, I'd like to really acknowledge my uh, many collaborators, um, particularly uh, actually a graduate student, Wes Furman, uh, and uh, um, postdoc John Liner at Oak Ridge National Lab, who have been uh, uh, driving this, uh, this uh, Newton scan research, uh, but also Tara McQueen and Sayed Copayet of Johns Hopkins University, who kind of jumped into this uh, uh, to this field when some of us began to be interested in it, in it and they've really been um, um, uh, both uh, providing uh, the group at Johns Hopkins University, IQM, with the uh, high quality floating zone growth materials, but also providing kind of um, uh, chemists' insight into what this material really is and how we should be thinking about it. And of course, we've been using a, a spallation neutron source at Oak Ridge National Lab and uh, funded mostly by the Department of Energy. Um, so, most of the meeting has been about uh, charged excitations, and we're now going to be talking about charged neutral excitations, um, which are probed very uh, effectively with the magnetic neutron scattering technique. Um, so, it's uh, neutron comes in, neutron comes out, and measure the probability of scattering versus momentum and uh, energy transfer. That's the, the simple take on it. Um, this is a technique where we can actually write down the scattering cross section and we can measure this thing. Um, uh, we, we've tested it, we know this expression very well. Um, and so what we're really probing is this two-point spin-to-spin correlation function. And um, we can relate it to the generalized dynamics of stability, chi of q and omega, the imaginary part of that. So you can think of this as a kind of a very fancy measurement of the um, magnetic response function in momentum and uh, energy space. But to really give you a bit more of a feel of it, I just want to show you a couple of examples of these kinds of experiments. Uh, here is perhaps the most kind of um, classical type of measurement that you might uh, uh, anticipate from neutron scattering. This is a material which is magnetically ordered, um, and it has you know, Bragg peaks in it. It's a kind of a semi-classical type system with a large moment, and so it has symmetry breaking, and it has correspondingly these Goldstone modes of excitation, and with neutrons you can really probe uh, the spin wave excitations throughout the zone as intensity appears in these false color images, they look quite a bit like the, uh, uh, or they have some sort of similarity in terms of the 
uh, energy axis and the momentum axis to uh, many of the beautiful office data that we saw uh, yesterday. Um, these are sort of collective excitations um, uh, that, uh, that occur typically with these kinds of neutron scattering experiments. And by analyzing these dispersion relations, we can pick out, or these individuals pick out uh, a lot of exchange constants. Um, and that's kind of the way it, uh, it goes. Um, but um, I want to talk more about quantum magnetism. This was sort of a semi-classical system. And we come, when we come to quantum magnetism, it turns out, uh, and this sort of came out in the context of figuring out the Helmane uh, phenomenon. You know, it was a really kind of surprise to the field that there was such a thing as a gap in the excitation spectrum in a, um, in a system that was isotropic. It was really very strange for people to think about it. Then over the years, uh, it's sort of been, um, been understood. And, and there's a very beautiful, interesting work uh, that comes from the Deep Schultz Matters Theorem and then augmented by Oshikawa Hastings and, and, and others that you can actually figure out you know, whether or not that can be a gap in the excitation spectrum of your magnet by just counting how many spin half degrees of freedom you have per unit cell. So if you have an even number of spin half degrees of freedom, then you can have a gap in the excitation spectrum. And you tend to have that if you're sort of a, if, if, um, uh, if um, uh, you tend to have that uh, if, uh, if the, uh, but you must, it, it doesn't have to be the case. You can have it and mostly we end up seeing a gap in the excitation spectrum. On the other hand, uh, the, uh, the theorem is stronger in the case of an odd number of spin half degrees of freedom uh, when you really cannot form a gap unless you have, uh, 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 well, I think uh, mostly cannot form a gap. Maybe there's some very esoteric examples where you could, but generally odd numbers of spin half, you end up with a gapless excitation spectrum. And um, good. So, so let's see a couple of examples where this actually comes to bear. The simplest one. Uh, is actually this kind of uh, compound which, which is simply has an even number of spin half per unit cell. Uh, it's really, really simple, nothing complicated at all, uh, because there's simply what happens there is that the, uh, the pairs of spin half um, combine, you know, they have a, a quartet of states, but they actually split as a result of the isotropic exchange interaction into singlet, ground state, triplet, excited state. And the susceptibility is now exponentially activated. In a sense, you have no magnetism in the system left because you had the formation of a singlet. And the neutrons, and this just so we kind of to bring you in the kind of data that we're going to be looking at for SMB6 later, with neutrons, you basically see uh, a peak in the excitation spectrum at the energy that corresponds to uh, making the transition from the singlet up to the triplet state. And in the case of this material, there's some interaction between these pairs of spins, and so you get some dispersion. Uh, it's not a completely flat level, but there is some dispersion because you can actually have these triplets travel along the, uh, along the chain, as it were, in this case. So th this is kind of the very simple uh, example of, of an even number of spin half per unit cell. Uh, the less, uh, significantly less trivial case is that of a uh, spin one degree of freedom. So now the unit cell is here. This is the two spin half degrees of freedom. And according to the theorem that I mentioned, it's now possible to have a gap in the excitation spectrum. And that gap is, is then called the Helling gap. Um, it actually does occur when you have the one-dimensional spin one uh, case with coordination number of two. Um, and this is a very interesting state. Actually, uh, the neutron excitation spectrum uh, looks like that. It corresponds to promoting this uh, to a triplet, which travels along the spin chain. Uh, but it also has a topological character that gives rise to an end uh, degree of freedom, a sort of an edge state, which is the spin one half that sits at the edge, and that's been seen experimentally uh, as well. Now, there's another way that you can also get a gap in the excitation spectrum of the spin one chain, which is you can form the gap locally. So each of these spin, the, the, uh, each of the um, spin one degrees of freedom can itself um, form a singlet state, um, and then you get uh, then you get a, 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 a completely trivial type of, uh, of singlet uh, system, um, which has also been seen uh, in, in, some, uh, in some cases. And you can actually see the phase transition from that kind of trivial singlet into the non-trivial um, uh, topological singlet state uh, of the Helding uh, phase. Um, OK, so, so that was all uh, singlet formation amongst uh, spin one half degrees of freedom that are um, that are separate, separated from each other. Um, but it's also possible um, to have a singlet form where there's an even number of spin one half or an even number of electrons uh, that sits on, on a single atom. And so this I want to illustrate looking at the 
And this will also introduce the concept of crystal field excitations that we, that we should have in mind. And this is the case of a um, presidemium-based uh, system. So presidemium uh, is a non-chromatide ion, and it has so an even number of uh, F electrons, and the, it has strong spin-orbit coupling. So you end up with a spin-orbital singlet. Uh, sorry, a spin-orbital um, uh, an integral spin-orbital quantum number j equals to four. And as a result of that, or if you will, just the result of having an even number of um, of electrons per uh, per rare atom. It's actually possible to have a singlet form uh, under the influence of the, um, uh, of the uh, electrostatic environment of the, uh, created by the ligands. And this can actually be probed with neutron scattering as well. And here's, here's actually the, uh, the excitation spectrum uh, that you see when you scatter from this kind of system at low temperatures, 5 Kelvin, and, and uh, which maybe we should focus on that. There's various peaks in the excitation spectrum that you can associate with transitions and you can lay out this uh, uh, crystal field uh, level scheme of the nine uh, crystal field um, of, of the nine members of this J equals to four uh, system. And one finds in this case that there's actually a non chromous doublet ground state. And so it has to be non chromous it's, it's, it's there only because of the point group symmetry of the site. Um, and so it's, it's actually, in a sense, a quite delicate thing, um, as opposed to the case of a chromous uh, doublet system. And this actually comes out of an interesting way in this material, uh, this kind of a del the delicate nature of the, of the uh, non chromous doublet, because when you go and make an alloy out of it, then you've actually ruined the point group symmetry. There's no, you know, every side is, is, is special, and there's very low symmetry at every side of this lattice, and so this doublet no longer exists. And so actually the specific heat becomes uh, very strongly enhanced at low, uh, at low temperatures, which initially was thought to be a result of some sort of correlated physics. But actually, when you go and do the neutron experiment, we find that the, the spectrum is very simple, and it's not temperature dependent. And it's simply defined by the distribution of, of the uh, local environment of crystal fields. So this lifts the doublet degeneracy, um, and uh, you get some sort of distribution of, of, uh, of energy levels, which, which becomes which even has some sites which are very close to being a double. So they cannot form an ordered state because they're too dilute, and you end up with this uh, strange kind of enhanced specific heat. Another thing I want to point out with this experiment is that you notice this kind of uh, single ion physics by looking at the so-called form factor, which is part of the neutron scattering cross section too. And that this form factor is essentially just the Fourier transform of the spin density. And the intensity in this case of all of these excitations simply follows this form factor. So that directly says, OK, you're dealing with single ion physics. Um, and so then sort of in the conclusion from all of this introduction uh, is that um, magnetism in, these, in the kind of in the quantum limit, when we're not talking about um, um, uh, correlation lengths having diverged and getting into an ordered state, that magnetism really has to be protected to avoid singlet formation. That seems to be kind of the the, uh, the prevalent uh, theme, and we saw it in the case of pairs of spins. We saw it in the case of the uh, integral spin and the Haldane effect, and we saw it in the case of this uh, delicate non chromous doublet, uh, in the case of the, uh, of the integral uh, spin orbital angular momentum of the presidium line. Uh, just to allay your concerns that you can have magnetism in the, sort of in the quantum limit, then when you go to a, uh, a lattice which has just one spin half per unit cell, um, and is sufficiently frustrated to suppress order, uh, then you cannot have a gap in the excitation spectrum, and you end up with, um, uh, with this kind of continuum of uh, excitation that indicates uh, fractionalization. So you, you can have, uh, it is possible to have this magnetism even in insulating systems. Okay, so then I'd like to, to ease our way into talking about uh, conducting um, uh, materials and, and itinerant magnets by thinking about the compound V203, uh, which uh, we worked on uh, with, uh, uh, with Wei Bao uh, quite some years ago. And it, it's so lovely because it has all of the phases that we're familiar with from kinetic matter physics. And starting just to in introduce what the scattering data looks like for such a system, starting in the paramagnetic insulator here, uh, there you have in the paramagnetic phase kind of a blob of scattering in momentum. This momentum, this is energy transfer. So, uh, just, just some very broad peak which indicates, let's say, the Fourier transformed exchange interaction that exists uh, in, this, in this phase. And now when you come into the metallic states, I'm just crossing the mod, uh, the mod transition from the insulator to the mantle, you have this 
feature acquires an additional kind of length scale. It sort of splits out into two, uh, two maxima. And that we associate actually with a kind of an umklaut process, so a nesting condition on the Fermi surface that has now developed as I pass from the insulator to the mantle. Uh, so that's the distinction. This is the, the pure exchange, and this is now the, the, um, the, um, uh, the, uh, the nesting condition which is, which is coming out. And of course, then when you cool down to very low temperatures, uh, then that becomes the dominant feature, and you end up with a spin density wave state which is formed as a result of the uh, of the nesting conditions on the Fermi surface. And the way we usually talk about that um, is in terms of a Lindhardt susceptibility that you might think of calculating from the, from the band structure. Uh, and when you have you know, large parts of the Fermi surface uh, that can shift into each other with some particular wave vector transfer Q, uh, there's an enhanced susceptibility at, that, at those particular wave vectors. And this can lead to this kind of feature and then eventually to the ordering. And typically, you need to involve both you know, these uh, family surface features as well as some exchange uh, features to, to produce these kinds of results. Now, one kind of message I wanted to bring from the neutron community is that we would really like to see more calculations of these uh, Lindhardt susceptibilities for interesting materials. Uh, so very often we see beautiful band structures and family surfaces. Uh, the way that neutrons connect to that is really through this kind of susceptibility. And I know it's kind of tricky and time consuming to calculate, but we are now really being able to, to measure these things. Really interesting to, to to have more of those uh, kinds of calculations uh, available. Okay, so now um, turning in now to look at the case of uh, Samarium hexaboride, I want to start off by thinking of a simpler world in which uh, this really was a 4F6 state. If it was not intermediate valence, you know, then things would actually be very simple for us. Um, and in fact, there's some aspect of, of the data that really reflect. Um, the nature of this, uh, of this state, which is, as we've heard, uh, um, pointed out uh, particularly by George Slavatsky and, and, and many others in the audience, is that that state actually is a spin orbital singlet. So because of being less than half filled and so on, I, uh, it's sort of more than half filled, I end up having to subtract the orbital and spin angular momentum, and I end up with a, uh, with a j equals to zero uh, spin orbital um, multiplet ground state. And um, in various papers, it's been pointing out that, pointed out that the temperature dependent susceptibility actually looks like what you'd expect from the Van Fleck contribution uh, from the transition between the spin orbital singlet and the, and the triplet. Um, so that gives sort of a temperature independent susceptibility that can uh, quantitatively account for, for, for what's, what's measured. So it's actually quite dull temperature dependent susceptibility. And this is actually confirmed in. Um, in measurements by neutron scattering of the form factor that I mentioned previously, which measures the uh, distribution of uh, spin around the atom. It's written out a bit more uh, correctly here. Uh, it can, can actually be measured with polarized neutron scattering. What you do is you apply a uniform field and you induce magnetization. Um, this induces a little bit of spin flip scattering on top of nuclear bright peaks. Uh, and by measuring the ratio of spin flip to non-spin flip, you can measure quite accurately this form factor. It was done back uh, in 1995 uh, by this by Bouchel et al. And they find that the uh, that the wave vector dependence actually matches that of the 4F6 form factor. And it, it's not consistent actually with the 4F5 form factor. So you don't seem to see the other valence component in that kind of measurement. Likewise, in the susceptibility, you don't really seem to see it. Now, I wonder why that is. You know, one way one could think about that is that the system responds um, to a uniform field with a uniform magnetization, which is predominantly coming from this contribution. The contribution from the, um, from the, um, um, from the uh, uh, 4F5 state, which would be a J equals to 5 half multiplet and, and is um, able to respond magnetically, may not be very strong at Q equals to 0. And then, so my, my sort of uh, claim will be that that state is actually, uh, when present, bound into some form of a singlet. So it's not really responding in these kinds of uniform magnetization measurements, either in neutron scattering or in uniform susceptibility. Uh, yes? What does the 4 of 5 look like? Uh, the 4 of 5 actually, uh, actually would have a maximum here. Uh, uh, one thing you should notice that the, oh, the scale is kind of weird. For some reason, people like to write it. Sine theta over lambda. This is momentum transfer. And this is about uh, this is about um, three angstrom, three or four angstrom inverse. So this one sort of keeps going out to three or four angstrom inverse. Okay. Now a little bit about the inelastic scattering. 
Um, and uh, this is work uh, done in, in just a series of uh, very beautiful papers by Alexei and Mignon. Um, uh, and, uh, and here is the inelastic scattering um, in, a, in a quite a wide range of energy transfer. And, and um, uh, okay, so, um, so, uh, the, the, so this is not kind of, I, I would say, it's, we can't say that it's sort of an ironclad interpretation, but the interpretation that's, that's uh, presented is that, the, uh, that this feature, this broad peak, is actually the inter multiplet transition between j equals to zero and j equals to one associated with the four of six state. Uh, and these features up here, which is which are quite kind of noisy, but if you look back at the original data, I think there is actually something there. But those are associated with um, uh, when I say original, is that these are actually background subtracted. But there seems to be some stuff going on at even higher energies, and those are thought to be associated with the inter multiplet transition from five half to seven half, associated with the four five um, uh, valence state of Sumerian. Um, but what about the excitations associated with the J5 half uh, anticipated uh, spin orbital ground state of the 4 or 5 sites? Um, so those uh, are thought to be associated with this feature in the excitation spectrum, amongst others. Um, and uh, so this one lives at around 40 milli electron volts. Um, and this will actually be sort of the focus of, my, uh, of, of the rest of my talk. Um, and, and shown here is the, uh, the data that reported the discovery of this mode, and maybe there was earlier papers, but it was sort of in this period that this mode uh, began to come out. Um, and there was, as I said, Alexa and Mignon who saw this thing, and it's actually a really difficult thing to see in a very, very unusual uh, feature in magnetism. I don't know a lot of other examples of this kind of peak. And I think sort of uh, the claim um, represented here that I, I would sort of echo in, in, in our further investigations of this is that this is really a characteristic collective mode that is associated with the mixed valence state. And we should be really looking for and understanding better what this, uh, what this actually is. Um, and so here's shown as a function of temperature heating from 2 Kelvin to, to 100, 112 Kelvin, the disappearance of this, of this mode. It's quite sharp in energy, approximately two, one or two milli electron volts, which is approximately the resolution Actually, I think that is the resolution for this experiment. There's a little bit of dispersion when you map the position of this peak as a function of momentum. You see it's sort of dipping at this particular wave vector transfer. Um, and there is generally some action going on in, in momentum space. Um, this kind of feature has also been observed actually in tulium selenide, which is another mixed variable compound. It also has a sharp mode of excitation sitting in kind of a similar uh, range of, of energy transfer. So it seems to actually have some sort of generality in these uh, mixed valence systems, though I think it may not extend much more beyond those couple of systems. Okay, now one thing that, that made these experiments so difficult and it's just really impressive that these gentlemen were able to see it at all, is that um, it turns out that uh, the intensity of this mode is all kind of packed in towards very low momentum transfer. Everything lives um, less than one angstrom inverse for reasons that I think are not quite uh, understood, in fact. Um, so then, uh, what happens there with, with the inelastic scattering with a massive particle such as the, the neutron is that there's a certain sort of kinematic limit that you just cannot get below. Once you've chosen your incident energy, which fixes the velocity for your neutron, then you will never, even at zero uh, scattering angle, be able to get less than lower than some particular wave vector transfer, which is given by this simple expression. So this, this is basically because ki becomes so long that I wave vector transfer will at least be ki minus km. So this is actually beginning to be problematic in this kind of system. All of the scattering, it turns out, lives below two angstrom inverse. Um, so it's really quite tricky to get access to that. Everything happens at really low scattering angles, you know, between, but lower than 20 degrees. And it turns out that there's now new instrumentation that, that we have uh, which, in a sense, for other reasons, turns out to be very good at measuring inelastic scattering at low scattering angles. Because these instruments, uh, these are time of flight spectrometers. There's a picture of the Sequoia instrument at Oak Ridge. But the distance from sample to detector tends to be five to six meters. And so it's possible to get to really low scattering angles. And furthermore, because of the nature of the spallation source, there's very good access to high energy neutrons, so very fast neutrons. And so it allows you to push down to lower momentum transfer. And so, um, you know, looking at looking at the Sumerian hexafluoride 
uh, story, uh, which was kind of bursting onto the stage. Uh, we thought that this would be very interesting to, to see what these new instruments could tell us about this kind of problem. And so uh, the first thing we had to, to overcome was the absorption uh, situation. Uh, and um, so both of these are highly absorbing, so you need to have a double isotope sample. Um, and we were very fortunate to be able to collaborate with the Mobile Alex 7. We're actually looking at the very same sample that they looked at uh, 20, 25 years ago, perhaps, and now on this new instrument. Um, so in that way, there's going to be a, a consistency, or there ought to be a consistency in the data. Uh, we've also been using a reference sample of lanthanum hexaborite uh, to, to kind of uh, subtract our various uh, phonon contributions. Um, and that was grown by Kofi and my and McQueen at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And they have the ability to grow the SMB6, but we, we have not actually grown or used those, those crystals uh, for, for our neutron scattering experiments. So then let me show you the, the new data, which now uh, readily can access all the momentum space. Um, so very kind of similar to, to the evolution, I think, in, uh, in um, uh, photoemission, angular resolved photoemission spectroscopy, we can now really get the whole thing, probably not as fast as you guys, but very fast compared to what we were used to. And this shows you a map of all the momentum space integrated um, from, uh, from uh, 4 millivolts to 20 million electron volts at 100 Kelvin. So it, it looks a little bit bland, uh, so don't get worried because once we cool to 5 Kelvin, so into the, um, into the insulated state, then all sorts of features actually appear uh, at various points in momentum space. Now, the previous experiments that were done on these uh, triple axis machines uh, found this part of the excitation spectrum, and that was uh, accessible, if you will, on those, uh, on those instruments. The new thing that was actually found was this excitation, or this, this mode, which sits at the X point, so the half OO location. And the other thing we, we now were able to see is that there is also intensity sitting at the next, in the next Berlin zone. So because you have both, you, um, um, so you can get uh, out to this point, x plus g, and there's also intensity at that particular uh, location. I think this, uh, I, I want to describe what is the, the significance of, of those uh, new discoveries from that instrumentation. Uh, first of all, and this is the old uh, uh, information from, from the uh, discovery papers, uh, 1995. This intensity, as, as you can see here, appears upon cooling. And then you and Alexeyev really map this out as a function of temperature. And you see that it looks kind of deceptively like the resistivity data almost. So this mode is something that comes along as the gap uh, opens up. Uh, and the mode becomes defined in, in terms of its lifetime once you enter the insulating, uh, insulating state. Um, OK, now, now I want to, I, since I'm sort of running out of time, I want to, um, I want to get to the thing that, that we still don't actually have a, a really understanding of it all. In fact, I think we can say we don't have really a clue about why this is the case. And that is that the, uh, the intensity of this mode, as I indicated, lives only at very, very low momentum transfer. And uh, with this, we can now say with some, um, with some um, uh, uh, what's it called, um, certainty, uh, because this is a, it is a simple uh, Brevet lattice in terms of the magnetic side. And so when I look at the ratio of intensities um, at uh, momenta that are separated by uh, reciprocal lattice vectors, that simply should go in, in accordance with a form factor. And so here are the data for X type and for R type. And for X type, we actually have several points on the curve. And for R type, we only have really two points. But uh, overall, they can, they can be placed on this intensity curve. And then they can be compared to the form factor for the, uh, for the, F, um, for the F side. <coughs> and it finds that uh, that's a solid line here. That would be for the F. Uh, form factor, and refines that the intensity really falls up much more rapidly than that. Um, and in fact, if you compare it to the dash line uh, that sort of goes through the data points, that is the 5D form factor. And so there is a uh, consistency in the sense that uh, the data is consistent with uh, 5D form factor. This is quite unusual, um, uh, but it, it, I think, shows that there's a, a strong involvement of the, of the D electrons in this exciton mode. And so maybe the picture that we can begin to bring to mind is that when the ion actually um, comes out as a, five, uh, as a 4F5 and, and has the orbital angular momentum associated with it, then it goes and forms some form of a singlet with the D electron uh, in such a way that the excitation actually acquires the form factor of the D electron and, and, and for reasons we don't quite understand actually loses its F character. So we see somehow this transition only through 
uh, the excitation uh, that has the form factor of the d-electron. Of course, there are also other possible interpretations, um, but this, you know, it doesn't have to be the d-form factor, but it does agree quite well with the d-form factor. Okay, so then um, I want to say a little bit about the, um, the energy dependence of this uh, feature. And so you can map it as a function of energy and momentum, and you see that there is a little bit of dispersion to the level of a couple of one to two milli electron volts. Um, and the node otherwise generally sort of hangs around at 14 uh, milli electron volts. And this really reminds me a lot of, of these kinds of uh, singlets that we see in, in quantum magnetism. Um, and so that was why I gave that kind of um, introduction. A couple of additional features we can pull out from this. There's a, there's a total moment sum rule that allows us to extract the overall uh, amount of angular momentum associated with this excitation. And that turns out to be consistent with 40% of the, um, of the sites. Uh, so, so it corresponds to 40% of the sites being in the SM uh, Samarium 3 plus state, which is not so dissimilar from, from the mixed valent uh, component that we expect. So this really carries a lot of spectral weight even though it has the d-electron form factor. So this is, this is a bit of a uh, surprise to us. Uh, this shows the kind of the raw data just cuts through these, and you can see that there really is a dispersion, which is important because that says that it is a coherent mode that can actually travel through the crystal, like when I talked about these uh, singlet to triplet excitations. When I form the triplet, it can actually move through the crystal. Um, and we can go and, and look at the dispersion relation uh, for this mode, which is, which is shown here. Um, it tends to be a very sharp, actually, this, is, this dashed line shows our resolution, taking into account the disperse, dispersive contributions, then the mode is, is actually resolution limited, it seems to be really a long-lived mode, which means that it lives in the gap and becomes really a, a, a sharp, um, a sharp long-lived excitation. And then a, a final thing I want to point out is that the oscillator strength associated with this mode, which you pull out from the data like that, is momentum dependent. And that actually says that this cannot be some sort of trivial crystal field excitation because that would carry a constant oscillator strength through the zone. And it, it brings our attention to some form of a nesting type um, feature, which is to um, explain why there is momentum dependence to, the, uh, to this uh, intensity. So I'd like to make a few connections to other uh, experiments that we've been looking at during the, uh, during the uh, meeting. Um, and of course, yesterday we talked a lot about this uh, level scheme. And it, I think it's quite interesting to note that the, the difference between these uh, energies actually is very close to this, uh, to this, to the energy uh, of 14 milli electron volt, 19 minus three gives me 16. So it's somehow quite close. So if this mode in some ways was linked to this exciton, uh, then perhaps there would be a, a, a path towards understanding this kind of level scheme and action this points towards or sort of in favor of having this in-gap state being somehow connected to that singlet to triplet uh, transition. Uh, the scanning tongue microscopy data of um, Jenny Hoffman uh, also shows an excitation close to this energy and at the same, uh, and also dominated by the X point uh, mode at the half OO. Um, so it seems that there may be a connection there. And then I'd like to point out as well is that there's a Raman mode of excitation um, which has been, uh, been seen initially by Nihus and, and uh, Lance Cooper now. And so there was a, a nice poster by, Jamie, uh, by Michael Valentin and, and Natalia Gritschko. Uh, where they've also been seeing this uh, and they've been noticing the strong sample dependence of this mode. Um, but um, in the high quality sample, there seems to be uh, a mode of excitation at roughly the same energy as this, uh, as this uh, exciton that we're uh, reporting with neutron scattering. Uh, and this mode also appears upon cooling in the same fashion as, as the neutron inelastic P. Uh, the uh, Rama experiment has been carried out as a function of magnetic field, and one sees that this mode actually is split by the magnetic field. So there's some sort of uh, uh, there's some sort of um, de uh, degeneracy of the uh, excited state, which would be consistent with a singlet to triplet uh, type excitation. Um, I think I'm sort of running a bit uh, out of time, but maybe I, I'd like to just uh, touch on, on, on one thing, which is that one can actually make a connection between the momentum dependence of the intensity that we see in, in uh, neutron scattering. So that, that would be the MDC, I think the, like the, the map of intensity as function of momentum, uh, can be related to the band structures I mentioned through this Linhardt calculation. And um, uh, what uh, Wes Berman did was that he, he tried to take the simplest possible band structure which would produce this pattern of intensity. And it turned out that if you just 
not only add in a tight binding description the, uh, the diagonal hopping, you can actually produce this kind of map of intensity. So it seems that there's, um, there's some sort of indirect information of the band structure that we can pull out, um, that you can pull out from these kind of, uh, these kind of data. I do have kind of more uh, things I could say, but I think I'm running out of time. So I just want to, to summarize um, is that uh, single information is, is, uh, is what we see in quantum magnetism. Um, and it may also be associated with this uh, Samarin 3 component in the scattering Samarin hexaboride might explain why we don't seem to see it showing up in the uniform uh, susceptibility because it's tied into the singlet. Um, uh, a few words, so what I said about the exotome is listed here, um, and I'd, I'd like to just draw attention to the two things that we don't understand, uh, the momentum dependence, I think this, this is really an open and important theoretical question, and then there's the question of what does this mode actually do when you, let's say, apply pressure or when you get to the surface of the system, uh, and there I would, I would, you know, from experiences in quantum magnetism, usually this kind of feature which carries a lot of spectral weight becomes a soft mode of some form of phase transition. So one could imagine that at the surface of the, of the material, this mode would condense, and that would explain why I'm sort of leaning towards an antiferromagnetic interpretation of what might be happening at the surface, because these modes have intensity at the antiferromagnetic points. Um, and, and we're very interested in progress on the theoretical part, and we're also uh, pushing forward with plans to, to do additional experiments uh, in the future. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, this, this thing has so um, it has half of the intensity that you would that you would expect if all of the atoms were in the three plus state. That's a lot. That's a lot. It really carries a lot of intensity. It's not like you know the little resonance modes you need to bring superconductors, which is just a teeny tiny little. No, no, no. Th this is kind of the main, yeah. in my estimation, the main magnetic response of the system. That's what. That's why I think that this thing must play a role as we get to the surface of the material. And it could play a role in the transport problems as well. It's really just the main spectral feature of the system. Yes? Um, it's just a comment. Uh, you, you didn't mention it, but a similar type of thing, apart from the form factor anomaly that's been seen in observing boron 12, where the, well, where you're going between an F13 and an F14 state, in that case, well, there is no form factor problem, I guess. And, uh, the interpretation you have in terms of an antiferromagnetic thing seems to, to work there quite well. I wondered if you might have a slide that sort of shows this type binding calculation and the nesting, just to make a little bit of connection to the, you know, to the background and band structure that underlies the interpretation that that was made in the paper that we published. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm uh, slightly embarrassed in a way because I, uh, there's been such a lot of progress, I think, in the Arcus to try to understand the band structure. Uh, but I think, on the other hand, um, you know, our, the band structure that we're looking at is the absolute simplest thing that you could possibly write down that would produce this intensity. So I think it's probably some form of an effective low energy band structure. In that sense, it has some, some relevance. Um, uh, so all it does is that it, it has the diagonal hopping, that's the only part that we add, and we actually give it an opposite sign for the D and the F band in order to have the formation of the hybridization gap. So you, you have this kind of band structure. So for the D, for the, uh, for the D band, it's the dash thing, uh, and for the F band, it's, it's this. Uh, and as they overlap, you, well, I promised I was not going to show this, but I'm sorry. So it, it overlaps. Uh, and then you, you get this kind of band structure. You get the band inversions, particularly at the x point um, uh, and the gamma. So I have the opposite character of the bands at the x and the gamma point, and, and that produces the uh, topologically non trivial state. And that also produces the nesting condition that gives intensity at the, at the x point. So, in a sense, 
one finds, at least in this high symmetry and simple case, that there is a correspondence, let's say, between places in the momentum space where you have intensity and band inversion. So the band inversion gives rise to intensity at the x point uh, and, and, and at the r point, this is the half 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 point, which, which um, uh, where we also have intensity, but which doesn't count in the uh, in the in the uh, um, in the uh, in the calculation of the churn index. Only this one actually counts. Um, okay, so that's the that's the underlying band structure, and then um, there's there's um, uh, quite a story to this, uh, which started with the work of uh, Peter Reisberg, um and <coughs> which uh, uh, Friedrich Nick Nikolic, not to uh, was, uh, actually picked up. Um, uh, in his visits to the department, we coaxed him into to try to do a more kind of detailed calculation based on this very simple band structure. So he would be able to work with the more complicated band structures. And we just took the simplest possible case and uh, was dealing with the uh, uh, electron. So the F band is treated just as, as a, a single band. So it's a, the simplest possible situation. But there is this, um, this uh, repulsion, on-site repulsion, which is dealt with using uh, the slave boson, boson method. Um, and then um, the formation of the exotome is, is extracted in the same way as in the papers by Peter Reisberg uh, to actually uh, to produce this exotonic mode. Uh, and there are quite a few parameters actually when, when you dive into it, and, and he can, and Friedrich can explain more. But with not sort of unreasonable um, parameters, he's actually able to produce uh, an exotome which lies at that energy. Um, and he's able to have dispersion which looks quite a bit like the data. Um, but I, I think he, he would not claim that this is like the connection from material to excitation. But this general framework can produce this kind of singlet uh, to triplet uh, to multiplet excitation. So then I might just remark, and maybe looking a little bit ahead to some of the discussion we're going to have, I think. Um, then, so this has something to do with, with the way in which magnetism is lost in this material. And in one picture, you could imagine a singlet state that was kind of local in a, in a rather condo-like sense, somehow taken over into a, a band. Or in this picture, it has the look of a band of a magnetism that's that's been lost through charge fluctuations and, and just simple band theory. And I, so I think for the bulk, one of the interesting issues is the extent to which the, the magnetism has been lost in a kind of heavy fermion way, or whether it's been lost in a, you know, as you might say, it, it got lost in, what, uh, aluminum, uh, where, where you just had charge fluctuations on an energy scale that simply did away with the magnetism. And you know, here, we, here we have a, a kind of an effective theory, and we might wonder, where is that effective theory coming from, and what's the relation between the role of the charge and the spin fluctuations? Does the D4 factor come out of this calculation? No. It doesn't. So, we, so, um, <clears throat> so he does not say that it should have an F form factor. Yeah. But he says that the calculation is very complicated, and it's, it's uh, possible that he would actually pick up a D form factor. But the calculation is not done. Um, so, so I think there are ways that you could imagine form factor to actually be important and it, it involves how what is the specific character of the wave function at these points which are involved in that transition. And uh, um, if you imagine that simple band structure you might imagine there would be some signature at q equals zero, not just q going across the Fermi surface. Do you know if there's any any spectral way to q equals zero? Uh, I would refer to the Raman experiment for but q equals to zero, and they, where they do see this mode at this energy. I see. Uh, but with neutrons, um, <coughs> with neutrons, we could access it at, at the um, at the uh, next brilliant so, um But I don't see, think we actually see something there. So I would suspect that it's heavily suppressed by the by the ball factor. Not well. You see, we see this one. That's an x plus g. So there are other uh, specific lattice points. Uh, so uh, if I was to look at here, for example, that is a reciprocal lattice point, but there's no intensity C. Um, that doesn't mean that there's no intensity, but I think it means that it's much less, so that the matrix element is much less at that wave vector than, uh, than at the antichromagnetic wave vector. And I would, you know, just from thinking about uh, insulating 
moments of consumer information. So I would think that that would be a structure factor which is suppressing that, and that the main intensity is lying at the anti-ferromagnetic points because the singlet is one that involves um, in, that involves screening the F spin of this side with the D spin of this side. So it, it sort of takes on an anti-ferromagnetic character, and then it loses intensity at, at the fluid to zero point. But maybe there's a whiff of it left which you see in Raman. And, and this is a, this is a spin one explanation you see from this uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I think what we see is the spin flip with this uh, component where we add angular momentum of, of H bar to the system, but that could be more complexity than that in it, I suppose. Yeah, You're thinking about an actual semiconductor? Yes, actual semiconductor, but the spin orbit coupling. So, so, so that experiment has not been done, basically. I mean, uh, it has not been done. I, I think the general kind of reaction, I would say, is that, that those are very extended wave functions, and, and I would have to really live at very, very low momentum transfer, which we just haven't been able to do. I mean, this, that's basically why this. Well, it was seen, but it's a really tough experiment. I think we could now begin to work our way towards lower Q and might be able to do such things. I, I would expect it should be there. We just have a look. Okay, well, one last question. Well, I just wanted to point out that regarding uh, the symmetry of this object and its spin and selection rules, and I think it's important to point out that it's seen in Rama, but it's not seen in the conventional objects. There's no sign of it that that's usually that would just be able to show you that the objects would just be. So yesterday when I was talking about modes in the gap, uh, the, the direct observation like this of a mode in the gap has two parts of the character. Uh, presumably this guy won't help to trying to provide a source of electrons that you could excite, uh, or, or could it? I mean, could you imagine an exciton that somehow also has some charge character, and then I could break it up and, and excite carriers? I mean, is that crazy? I don't. I Probably mean, not. I don't think it's crazy. I mean, the, the things that, the way you might think about this is that the, the, the 4F6 is this local singlet. Then you take a D electron and you your F electron, move it to a D electron, and you, you have this in-gap state, but you've now gone some way towards separating the charge, and you can now have, have transport from that. So it seems that there should be a connection. So that's the missing, the missing D electrons are now excited up into a, some band-like conduction band. Yeah. It's, yeah, so this perhaps could be, could be one and the same mode, yeah. playing the role of all these things. Yeah, in fact, I'd be surprised if it wasn't in a sense, because it is spectrally such a significant feature. You okay? Okay. All right. Well, I, I had lots of more questions, but um, so is, would it be fair to say that in some sense you're seeing the cosmos screening cloud developing as the system goes in its waking state? Yeah, I think that, that, that sounds, seems sounds intuitive to something like that. Yeah, right? yeah you're creating this, this screened object, you're separating the charge, and now you have this. Yeah, it's unreasonable. Uh, we'll have a discussion session later. <laughs> when Josh has to keep. <laughs> uh, well, just a very quick. So in the, in the period itself, there was no interaction between the D and the F on, on site. Because there is no. quite a strong exchange yeah. interaction, actually, between the D and the F, right? Yeah. That was not in there. That was not in there. All right. Thank you.